On today's show, here's why the Cleveland Cavaliers have to re-sign Karis LeVert. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. I'm Chris Manning, covering the Cavs in the NBA for outlets like SB Nation, Cleveland Magazine, the Just Basketball Show, and more. That man over there is Evan Damerel, the founder of Independent Site, right down Euclid, which covers the entire Cleveland sports scene. As always, Jake Stevens is producing Stream the Merrier wherever you get your music. Want to thank you again for making Locked On Cavs your first listen every day. Day, remember, free and available wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, I want to remind you that you can catch NBA games on the Series XM app on the XXM app, search Cavs or whatever NBA team you're watching on there. And today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, where first time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code Locked On. That is prizepicks.com. That promo code is Locked On. Okay, so couple housekeeping notes. We're back. I had a, I moved. I have a new setup. If you're watching on YouTube, the lighting's better in here. It's wonderful. We're figuring out the camera settings and things. So if things look a little different, it's because they're getting better. We're moving on up in the world. And that's exciting. But Evan, let's talk about Karis LeVert. I think point blank, the Cavs have to keep him. They, there is not an off season where I can understand for a variety there are business reasons, there are basketball reasons why they have to bring him back. They have to do this, I think. Where are you at on all of this? I agree with you. I mean, barring anything unforeseen, I don't think like a Donovan Mitchell type player is just going to suddenly become available for Cleveland and the Cavs just can't suddenly acquire that said player because they used their assets to get Donovan Mitchell last year. And in terms of just the free agency market, it's not super deep in terms of what Cleveland needs. And you look at a guy like Karis the Vert. Yeah, you uh, can offer him more money, which is obviously a clip in your back pocket just in terms of him being an unrestricted free agent. But I was intrigued. Um, playoffs notwithstanding, of course, but like I was intrigued by what we saw from Karis the Vert by the end of the season. And I think there is an avenue and a runway for Cleveland to sign him to not like a four year extension or anything like that. Maybe a two plus one or a one plus one kind of situation and use that as a trade chip as well. Maybe something does materialize down the line, but he was fully healthy last year for the most part, um, which is, you know, just a big knock against Levert for his entire career. But it, it was this weird, sudden transformation he had um, about midway into the season where he became Cleveland's super six man, which make, makes sense on paper, but it was more so the fact that he became malleable as a player and he decided to fit in, not fit out as one LeBron James once said to Kevin Love, but it was just a flexibility and a function thing that made Levert just kind of gel with what the cast needed, whether it was perimeter defense, three point shooting, tertiary playmaking, playing off of Warner Mitchell or Garland, which we'll, we'll get into all wait, of hold, that. Hold on. A- answer, the, answer the question. Do, yeah, do they yeah. do they have to resign him? Let's get to let's yes. get into it. Yeah, let's get yeah. into it. Your your team every day. Let's get into it. Yes, yeah. they need to resign him because their options are kind of limited otherwise. Here are the three. I think there are three big reasons why this is the case. Number one, the free agent market isn't good. You can get other shooting guards. Dante DiVincenzo's out there. I'll keep hitting on that because I like him a lot. But like you go look at the market of wings. This is not a good swingman market. This is a bad, bad, bad swingman market. Correct. Number two, I think you need to keep him for salary trade purposes. You need salaries to trade, and bigger salaries are helpful in that. Karis LeVert in the 15 to $18 million range is a useful deal for trades. He gets paid, and it's, it's not fun for him to just like sign a contract to get traded. That, to me, feels in the cards here. Third, you did give up a first for him. You, can, you can't always think about assets, Evan. I don't think about them being gone. Like, There's all these different things. Like, There is a sunk cost at a certain point. You just have to say, like, okay, we messed up. You move on. 
But you're mm-hmm. in this point where you did give up a first for him. I don't think that's aged well. And I do think you have to try to maximize the value of him as an extent of giving up that first. I think those are the big three reasons of, of okay, so the free agency market being bad, the fact that you gave up a real, real asset to, keep, to get him in the first place, and you need his, his salary for trades. Which of those reasons to you is the most compelling one as to why the Cavs should have to keep Kara Silver this summer? It's mostly because the market isn't great. Um, suboptimal, to say the least, if you're something I'd say, as if you're a regular listener to this show. But um, it's hard enough, and I agree with your point on Dante DiVincenzo. Ideally, if you're Cleveland, you try to lock up him and Levert in free agency, but unfortunately, you are competing with every single team in the league because both are unrestricted free agents and uh, DiVincenzo has an option as well. So who knows what goes in that direction too. But Levert, as I said, um, you have his bird rights, which means one, you're able to go over the cap for him, but two, like you are able to extend him further if you wanted to, or maybe offer him more money than another team could just to kind of retain that talent. And it has a bit of a trickle down effect from there because I think you want to keep some cohesiveness and figure out just like the nitty gritty of what did or didn't work for this Cavs team. And to be frank, Cleveland had five functional players in the postseason and Jared Allen, not on the uh, rebounding side of things, of course, but Levert is a key cog for the Cavs offensively, especially just as a bench player. And you want to maybe retain that and keep building upon what was successful or what was otherwise a pretty disappointing end to the season. I think the fact that you need him for trades to me is where, is where I think this is the most compelling. Because I think if the Cavs are going to find a move that elevates what this group is, and it doesn't come from internal growth, it doesn't come from Evan Mobley taking a step forward, or Isaac Okoro, or Darius Garland taking another level, or whatever it is, you need salaries to then send out in, in trades, and you need salaries to match. The, the you know Dean Wade you can stack up at a certain point with what he's going to make Ricky Rubio you can stack up and get to somewhere but in terms of getting closer to one for one trades the salaries you're going to need are in that fifteen to like twenty something range with where the cap is that's going to be Karis Levert and that's going to be Jared Allen if it's not Karis Levert I think you just need the salaries to do it I I and I and I think if you're Karis Levert's camp if you're his agent. That's your, your you you have to just understand. I, I think that's your leverage play. It's like, hey, you gave up a first to get us. You said you want to bring it. You bring him back. You've said all this stuff publicly, okay? But you need you kind of need him for this. Like even if like look, we'll talk about the roster fit later in the show in segment three in mm-hmm. particular, kind of where he fits with with Mitchell and Garland. I I think there is a, a some redundancy in what he does. I don't think necessarily the best version of the Cavs has Karis Levert making eighteen million dollars on it. But if you sign him to $18 million for, for a, a two-year deal or a three-year deal, and it's 18 per, and you can parlay that into a player in that salary range that fits you better, ultimately, that's good business. Now, can you do that? That's a whole other question. That's not something we can even understand right now with where we know the market's at. There's, there's, this summer feels like a summer of change in the NBA to some degree. But I think at least if you get him in at 18 and you give yourself that salary, that gives you the option to do something with that level. So you and I are still in agreement on the fact, I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago on the show, but you and I have talked about it privately for sure. Um, 18 million annually, if it's just a flat contract, is the highest you'd go for Levert if you're Cleveland? I would, 18 is the cap, because I, I think there's a point, and even if, because no, there's, there's two reasons I would say that. Number one, at a certain point, teams are just, I think we're seeing that teams just don't always just want to pay bad salary just for, for trade assets. Secondly, mm-hmm. you also don't have the, the picks that you would need to attach to this to really sweeten like bad salary. So like you, you kind of just like need a team to like him enough at the right number in addition to some seconds. Like that's kind of where you're getting with this. It can't be, it, you're not going to be like, hey, it's Karras and, and a first in uh, a protected first. Like you don't have that option at this point. It has to, he has to be attractive to another team in a trade, I think, to some degree. I agree with you. Um, I think the asset aspect of it is interesting because, as you noted, um, the, the free agent market for swing man depth is pretty thin um, in, for this, this upcoming free agency class. And if Levert maintains that level of success with what I was talking about and just like that cohesiveness or maybe just like how he's becoming more of a malleable player, um, that could make him more flippable for a team that thinks like, okay, 
were willing to give up maybe a little bit more asset wise, which allows Cleveland to reload their clip a little bit to maybe go make a more splashier move. It, it, there's there's layers to this, but I, I think the market being so thin may help the Cavs a little bit just in terms of just being more of a flippable asset. I'm curious to see. I would love to know like kind of what I'm curious to see what we do learn about his market in the summer if if there is any bits of information we pick up. All right, after coming up next, Karis LeVert season review. So we're talking about him as someone who's going to get $18 million maybe in in the summer. Cavs got to bring him back. What makes us think that from a basketball standpoint, not just an asset standpoint, but a Mm -hmm. basketball standpoint? Today's episode is brought to you by Price Picks. To play, you pick two to five players, and if they go score more or less than their prize picks entry, you win. You can win up to 10 times your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It is just you versus those projections available. Prize picks offers projections on any sport that you watch. This includes the NBA, the NFL, MLB, NHL, PGA, college football when that's in season, and many, many more. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It is that easy. They offer safe and fast withdrawals, currently operational over 30 states and Canada. Download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. If you deposit $100, PrizePix will give you $100. If you deposit $50, PrizePix will give you $50. Don't forget to enter that promo code locked on and sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. Thanks for making Lockdown Cavs your first listen every day. Every day is we're going to be back tomorrow. We're going to react to the draft lottery. We're going to see where Victor Victor Wembenyama is going. And we're going to talk about what the draft in 2023 means for a team like the Cavs who don't have a lot of picks and don't have a first round pick. So stay tuned for that. Evan, Karis LeVert's... Wait, 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 wait. Quick question. Um, If you were the Cavs... And the team that gets the first overall pick, which will be Victor Vimidiana, um, approached you. How much would you give up for Wemby? You don't have enough. You don't have enough if you're Cleveland. If it's Evan Mobley and Darius Garland, would you give that up for Wembyana? Nah, I'm just riding with the guys that I like now. I'm a, I'm that, but that am I? Is that wrong? Maybe I don't know. But I, it's he's gonna be he's really special, probably. But uh, I, it's just probably. You, there are no sure things. Like there are very few sure things in life. It's it's taxes. Me trying to be more positive in life right now, Evan, and willing this out of you, and the fact that like sometimes like, hype, really high prospects aren't as good as we think they're going to be. That's just like that's more of reality than than things not working. That's fair. Um, sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes it doesn't work. But boy, but, oh boy, is he fun to watch play. <laughs> yes. Uh, curious to see where he. Ends up, um, hoping for hoping hoping I, for a chaos. I feel like hoping it's going to be Detroit. Well, that well, if that happens, that's that's some impact. We can we can talk about a central division. We can bring back the NBA divisions or at least the conferences. So, Karis LeVert season review: twelve point two points per game, forty three point one shooting from the field, thirty nine point two percent on threes, forty six point two percent on twos. That was his best career three point shooting season. His second mm-hmm. worst two point shooting season. So his mid range, Evan. This is this is where I think his season gets really weird, and and where I think like the two point stuff really kind of shows up. Mid range numbers use thirty three percent on mid range shots. That accounts for twenty nine percent of his shots. That short mid range area, that four to fourteen foot range, is an area he's never been like super super efficient. But he's been. Mm-hmm. This was the worst year he's ever had. That to me explains the two point stuff. I think there are reasons why that happened. I don't know if it's totally like all on him fully. There are other parts of a season I think we'll get into, but what do you just make of of what he he was last year? When you think of Karis LeVert last year, what what was he? So I'm willing to admit I was wrong with Karis LeVert, just looking at the entire body of work from this season. Um, I had a lot of questions going into the year, just with Donovan Mitchell being like the clear, obvious I don't think it's a hot take. Obvious starting two guard for the Cavs because prior to the Mitchell trade, you would assume Lavertis is starting to Colin Sexton's coming off the bench as your six man slash backup to Lavert, um, and you roll with it there. But Lavert to me 
was a bit of a clunky fit, and we'll get more into this between when you play the three of them together. That's why you saw Levert as starting three, and it just wasn't the cleanest fit altogether. Um, and we got a good taste of that in the postseason as well, just watching that unfold. But Levert um, really adjusted his game. I think it's interesting just because of the MIDI stuff, and I'm about to ask you about that. But like the three point shooting is there. I think the availability is the biggest thing for him, just because he has the ability. Like we we've seen it. Like he has the ability to go off. Like in that game against Boston when the Cavs are down Darius Garland, then him and Donovan Mitchell both scored 41 apiece against the Celtics in the Garden. And there's moments like that, or yeah, there's games where maybe he's not like super impactful, but he's doing the little things like being a decent enough point attack point of attack defender or providing you that secondary playmaking and things like that. But the mid range stuff is interesting to me because when you break down his package and body of work just as a, as a career, as a player, like he wasn't known as like a plus plus three point shooter. Like, yeah, he can provide it to you every now and then, but like he wasn't going to be like lethal from out there. And he was more of like that more old school two guard where he's more comfortable getting into the paint and be pulling up if he has to. Do you think that's more of a product of Levert trying to fit in with what the Cavs are trying to do this year or just maybe just the numbers or the math ain't mathing in this regard where uh, Levert just maybe had a weird year from the mid range and he had a hot, a hot er year rather from three point range. I think, I think it is a spacing issue to some degree. I think when you think about what the Cavs are and, and kind of what he has to do, mid range shots are a little easier when you just have room and he's driving into crowded lanes. There's not a lot of room for him to necessarily get in and attack. And I, and I think he played into, he clearly, I think worked on his three point shooting. Um, I think like he there there was an emphasis on that, and I think certainly he deserves mm-hmm. credit for for what that was. I think the mid range stuff feels to me like a spacing thing. I think there's probably just some bad luck in there as well. Maybe it's his role. You know, he is like the second or third ball handler, and it's like he's kind of having to attack in different ways. And he's not. Karis Levert, the way he plays is not necessarily a guy that I feel like is always great at playing off of advantages. What when the Karis Levert's thing is being very shifty and kind of a, he likes to break guys down he likes to play a little bit slower he's not a guy that's going to necess- always necessarily pounce into these spaces there are times where he has a great cut or he or he does take advantage of openness that is created mm-hmm. by others but it's not necessarily like what his skill set is and sometimes i think like he doesn't always end up getting like the easiest shots you know we don't have access to the spe- second spectrum data i would love mm-hmm. to kind of know what his shot quality kind of rates out that in that way um so i i think there's it's a little bit of everything i think he deserves credit for the three point stuff the two point stuff feels like a spacing issue and also just feels like his role and how he's getting his shots and the way he plays kind of contributes to, to his shot quality being a, a little bit harder. It's interesting. You note that maybe it could, a lot of it could be a spacing thing, especially with the caps playing two seven footers that just aren't shooters um, kind of relying on one of those two to be on the floor at any given moment. And Lavert kind of picks and chooses his sh- shots, but for a moment for me where He had, I believe it was either a mid-range shot or maybe he was closer to the rim. But like in that game against Brooklyn and Isaac Okoro hit the game winner, like to your point, credit where credit's due, like Levert is doing more so to maximize the winning opportunities for the team versus a guy in a contract here trying to like cash in his maximum possible returns at the end of the day. So there's smart plays, there's good plays, there's frustrating moments. And again, I'll admit I was wrong. Like, Lavert found a way to fit in with two very ball dominant guards that were clearly the one and two option on offense for Cleveland, considering whoever's on the floor between Garland and Mitchell. And he found a way to kind of fit in and coexist as that third or fourth banana at times where I looked at Lavert heading into the season thinking like, okay, this guy needs like a steady diet of shot opportunities in order just to kind of be functional as a player because he isn't great defensively um he isn't always reliable just in terms of health and availability but he really just quieted a little bit of that noise and at least heading into next year and like focusing on the extension talk from the first segment like yeah i, I warmed up to the idea of the Cavs extending karis levert and saying like at least looking at the free agency market and just looking at like his overall impact as a player like you can really make a pretty strong and solid argument for the Cavs signing him to some form of contract to keep him around, whether it's long-term or maybe just like at least next season. 
The other thing I think is worth noting is that he did stay very healthy this year, which is a very big deal for him considering his injury mm-hmm. history. 74 games for him this year was a career high, and at age 28, I, I do wonder if that holds going forward. He talked a lot about that over the course of the year, that he was healthy. I'm curious to see like if, if that is replicable, if he can be healthy again next year at, at age 29 into his 30s. Because mm-hmm. you know, if he has another injury and misses forty games like this, it, it throws it, it. If he had missed, you know, if he had missed 10, 15 games this year and played in the fifth year, we would have a very different look at this. And now you would have a little. It would feel, I think, a little bit more risky to be like, "Hey, we're giving this guy eighteen million dollars mm-hmm. if he'd been very injured." All right. After this, we're going to touch on Mitchell and Garland, how they looked with Lever, and, and what the numbers say and what the film says about that. Okay, in the regular season, Evan, Mitchell and Garland together overall, including lineups with Garland, plus 6.5 per 100. That was most of those with Levert as the starter, as the starting three. That statistically showed up that it worked in the regular season for whatever that's worth. Garland off, only Mitchell and Levert, plus 2.2 per 100. Garland plus Levert, no Mitchell, plus 2.9 per 100. And then when all three of them are on the floor together, plus 12 per 100. These numbers to me, what it to me, what it says, it kind of reinforces, I think, what we already know about the Cavs. We know that this team has a really had a very very good starting lineup. Mm-hmm. Obviously, it did totally show up in the postseason, but that was this team's bread and butter. Their starters were what drove the team's success. When you start moving away from only one of the All Star guards and moving away from the starters, and you have more mix and match. Mm-hmm. You see those margins become thinner. You know, plus 2.9 per 100 is not like a significant advantage. That's one three-pointer. And, you know, you're, it's, it's, you're, you're down. When there are three together, I think that just tells you how good the other four starters are more than it tells you how good Levert is. I, I don't feel like these numbers... I think like maybe this is me just being a hater, but I think what these numbers say in terms of all three of them together being really good is about Mitchell and Garland as a duo and what those guys provide you as a team more than it is, okay, this is how Karis Lert fits in with those guys. Yeah, and from looking at just like at the lens of regular season success between those three sharing the floor together, it's a pretty strong case on why J.B. Bickerstaff maybe first started Levert over Isaac Okoro and perhaps stuck with him throughout the postseason against the Knicks, but there's a lot of factors outside of control um, in terms of just advanced stats and analytics and the such like that, um, that the, the Cavs were a little off kilter. They were just out of rhythm and it's hard for a guy like Levert, who is a volume scorer who needs to see the ball go in and maybe needs to kind of feed off of, as you said, the gravity and just the impact Garland and Mitchell have on the floor. Because when those two are cooking like Levert as your third option on the perimeter, like that's a pretty good place to be if you're Karis Levert, because you're going to be left wide open more often than not because Mitchell is going to command double teams. Garland's going to command double teams. Those two are going to have to be completely hawked when they are um, on the floor because defenses are going to get killed if they leave them open or give them an opportunity to find daylight anywhere on the floor. So it's an interesting dynamic and you you saw it fail in the postseason. And to your point, I, I wonder if maybe that's more an indictment of the lack of depth on Cleveland's part and maybe the lack of spacing as well, because maybe that's a, that has a correlation with like Levert struggling in the mid range like he had. But I am interested to see how the Cavs optimize and pursue this offseason because there are wrinkles and tangible evidence that show like yeah, there's some stuff that worked between these three, but if you only have three guys that are functional on a night to night basis offensively, and you have Mobley and whatever he'll be, and then obviously um, Jared Allen as well, like you need a lot more than that. And it just, you know, if you keep feeding everybody, the whole village is going to be happy at the end of the day. And so let's just assume the Cavs extend Levert and they like look at the scope of the numbers, like, okay, how can we? perhaps either extrapolate this data because there's a lot of success early in the season with like spread pick and roll stuff with just Mitchell and Levert and you sharing that number actually kind of surprised me mm. um just like plus plus 6.5 like I was surprised I thought it'd be a little bit more than that but yeah I, I wonder if like Dean Wade's shot completely abandoning him has an impact on that or maybe like the jettisoning of Kevin Love had an impact of that as well like the, the lack of spacing next to Mitchell and Levert in that duo and assuming that like it's one of a Coro um, or two of a Coro Mobley and Allen out there with them as well, like 
really just threw a wrench in how the Cavs wanted to function because, again, Levert really <laughs> benefits from having like extra spacing around him and allows him to thrive and succeed and be like that multifaceted offensive threat that he is. This is, Evan, where I think we should, should end this. True or false, Karis LeVert is the right archetype of player to be the third um, piece in all of this uh, with these two guards. Okay, with the two guards. Um, he, is he like is he the right like swing man for for what they need? If they're if your if your core is Garland and Mitchell and Mobley, those are your main three core. Is he the right archetype player of swing man that you want? I want to say yes, but I need oh, so more I, tangible evidence of this three point shooting being sustainable. Yeah, see, I just because if I he just, gives you I that spacing, don't. it works. But if he, let's say he comes back down to earth and shoots Karis Levert numbers again from then, that's no disrespect, but regresses back to the mean in terms of three point shooting. Like, no, he doesn't become that answer when. Like, I can't, like, Dante DiVincenzo is a guy who makes a lot of sense. Um, Josh Richardson, I mean, at least with what he was at the Spurs, maybe even Doug McDermott with what he was at the Spurs. Like, there's defensive issues there, but, like, if you get, like, A++ or S+, three-point shooting, like, yeah, that's your ideal swing, man. Because I think just the defensive abilities of, like, Mobley, and we'll include Allen in this as well, just in terms of, like, covering for those defensive issues mitigates the concern because the spacing is just so paramount for the Cavs to succeed. And that's, that's my thing. Like reverse three point shooting isn't sustainable. No, he's not. But like, if this carries in the next year and he keeps building upon this, yeah, I think that's a thing that the Cavs could work with. I, I don't think he's the right fit. I don't think he's necessarily a, a kind of piece you don't want. But I think if I'm saying, okay, what is the right guy to be a fifth starter or the guy who closes with you, right? Like if you're saying, mm-hmm. what, are the, what are those two things? I think what you're looking for is, is more of like a 3-4 guy who can defend and, and, and switch and absorb some of that for you on, on the shooting. The ball handling is nice. I think you want a guy who, who, who doesn't panic with the ball in his hands, who does attack closeouts, and, and that's... But I think... I, I think you need more as just like, okay, like a, a, a shooter team's fear. I think we saw in the playoffs that teams don't really give a crap if Karis LeVert's standing on the on the opposite wing and, and standing there. I think mm-hmm. that was pretty clear. And I and I think defensively, if you're going to play Mitchell and Garland, and look, those guys competed on defense. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that they had like bad defensive seasons. What I am going to say is that those guys are going to get picked on in the playoffs and you need guys who can help you insulate from that. And you need guys who are bigger than and give you size and real chances at defending in the playoffs. And we, we just saw that. You need guys who are going to hold up better. Levert's not going to be that guy. Mm-hmm. I think you need to try to... Like, I don't... Those guys are really hard to find. DiVincenzo is not even like that exact guy. But if you told me... No. I, if you told me I could have... Lavert and DiVincenzo, or I could, or like that type of other two guard, or I could have Lavert, or if it had that type of two guard, that kind of kind of hybrid-y on-off ball guy that defends mm-hmm. a little bit and like turn Lavert into like a 3-4 type, I'm taking the 3-4 type 10 times out of 10. That is the piece that mm-hmm. I think really elevates what this roster is. I think Lavert like provides you stuff. He doesn't elevate you. I think if the, the right role guy you could go and find could elevate what this group is in a, in a, in a more impactful way. I think that's a good way to put it. And to your point about Dante DiVincenzo, he's not exactly what the Cavs need, but he's closer. He may not be that floor raiser, but he's closer to what the Cavs kind of need from that swing man position. Um, And you look at it and just in terms of help defense, just based on what the Cavs had, like Isaac Okoro plateauing as a three point shooter and just like not having the confidence of the coaching staff, especially in the postseason, like that, that was at least in my eyes heading into this season was the answer for Cleveland. Like if a took that leap offensively and was still like your best point of attack and perimeter defender, like, yeah, it makes the Mitchell and Garland stuff a little bit easier and you're not overtaxing Moley and Allen, but <sighs> like here, let me, I'm just going to give you a name that I don't think is realistic. Sure. But I, I think is like worth the thought exercise. Would you rather have Harrison Barnes or oh, Harris, Harris the Barnes. Harrison Barnes, because Harrison Barnes you, is a bigger forward. He can play three four. 
So exactly. And you look, you still have, would have, I think, real playoff concerns mm-hmm. because like we just saw hit the Warrior series. He was ignored. And, and that's a that's a problem. But would I would, would I prefer that and work around that versus what you're working around? With, I, uh-huh. I think I would. All that to be said, I think they're going to resign him for like a two or three year deal and we'll see where it goes. I think that's what what's going to happen here. I do, too. I think or rather I wouldn't be surprised when the news breaks that cares the vert signs some form of an extension with cleveland it's pretty publicly known at this point from both sides that there's a mutual interest to bring him back and as i was saying it just at the top of the show and all throughout this one like keep stretching this out to maybe see what you have and if you kind of hit a peak and something becomes available especially because the, the swing man market is so so thin maybe cleveland can finesse this into either a more a player that fits better for you or you use Levert to acquire assets and then turn that into what hopefully fits better for you, whether it's Harrison Barnes, Dante DiVincenzo, Joss Richardson, or heck, Karis Levert. So let's just say it's Karis Levert. Yeah, I think Karis Levert, um, pretty likely. I haven't let, well, true or false, just straight up true or false. Karis Levert is the starting small forward on opening night for the Cleveland Cavaliers in 2023, 2024. Opening false. night, not in it. False? Okay. I don't know. I, I, I need to see kind of what kind of things shake loose before I, I give an answer there. That's that's a fair answer. Um, like, if things get weird and someone shakes loose and things go differently, but as I, like if you had to tell me now, I would say I would almost say yes. But, like, do I feel confident in that based on what we think the market um, might be or what could come? I have no idea. There's still two... There's still two... There's still whole finals and conference finals to play, much less, like, everything else that might happen this summer. Oh, absolutely. And it's. If I was coaching the Cavs and I had full control of the rotation and roster, I would use Levert as my super six man and just punt on Ricky Rubio unless he's like fully healthy and like not a liability out there for you. But you really want to maximize Levert's opportunities. The best way to do it is just get him going with the bench and then let him finish games with Mitchell and Garland. That's going to be it for today's Lockdown Cast for Tuesday, May 16th. I want to remind you that you can catch NBA games on the Series XM app. That's XXM. Search whatever team you're looking for and catch the hometown broadcast. Thanks again for making Lockdown Cavs your first listen every day. Every day is back tomorrow, reacting to the draft lottery, talking about the draft, and whatever else kind of pops up tomorrow. Maybe they, we'll sort through some of the NBA rumors if there's some Cavs things we can pull on. Until next time, I'm Chris. That's Evan. Thanks again to Jake Stevens for producing. <laughs>